Hi everyone, uh, my name is Steve. Uh, I'm a front-end web developer. I currently work for a consultancy called PA Consulting, but I've actually got a new job. In two weeks' time, I'm gonna be the UI tech lead at Yale.com, uh, which is an uh, awesome move. I'm really, really looking forward to it. Uh, but today's about none of that whatsoever. Today, I'm here as a front-end web developer, and today, I'm here to talk to you about TVs. Um, and as we think about responsive web design, first buzzword of the day, um, the trend was kind of triggered by us wanting to make the web better on smaller devices, smaller handheld devices. And now the internet encroaches on pretty much everything we do in our lives. And so, yeah, it won't be long till it, uh, it takes over our larger screens as well. And now, if you live in the UK, which most of us do, there's a 98% chance that you've got a digital television. Um, it might not be very big, it might be kind of 32, uh, 32 inches gem, uh, generally, uh, but actually we are getting larger than that. Uh, the majority of TVs sold these days are now large TVs. Um, and the TV is still the family center of entertainment. Uh, Jamie Thicket, uh, Ofcom's director of research, has said uh, that their research shows increasingly that family, families are gathering in the living room to watch TV, just as they were in the 1950s, but now delivered on bigger, wider, and more sophisticated sets. Um, and that's really not an outdated statistic. Uh, we actually watch more hours of TV now than we have ever done throughout the history of television. We watch nearly four hours of TV content per day. However, we do things a bit differently. Unlike the 1950s family, we also do our own thing. We tweet. We uh, look up IMD, uh, things on IMDb. We do what they call meshing. Um, and uh, people are doing this more often. So the TV is still a very important part of our living room life. But it's now just part of a larger ecosystem as well. So effectively, it's just a larger screen. Um, and now, this is my living room. This is where I live. This is my living room. Um, <coughs> there are a lot of different things going on. Yes, I, have, I like my living room. Uh, so there's a media center PC, there's a Wii, there's a nice big TV, there's a NAS, there's an Xbox, there's also a Sonus player in there somewhere. Uh, there's a Chromecast plugged into the back of the TV as well. Honestly, there's a lot. And so actually, there's three or four different ways that I can get the internet onto my TV in my living room. Um, and that's just kind of the tip of the, ice, uh, tip of the iceberg. You could have an Apple TV. That could be a smart TV. It's not, uh, but it could be. They could have a Wii U. I could have a Google TV. There are, and that's just the kind of the modern ones. There's all sorts of different ways for you to get the internet on your TV. Um, and when I, I tried to look into the stats for this, and I thought, actually, what is the marketplace for this? Uh, turns out that there are seven million households with an ability to get the internet onto their main television set, their center of family entertainment. That's 39% of households in the whole of the UK. Uh, that's, pretty, that's quite a lot, and that's a, a March 2013 statistic. Um, but it's not really smart TVs. Smart TVs make up about 7% of uh, what all households have. That's increasing. It's more and more smart TVs being sold now than there were ever before, but it's not a majority yet. The way people actually get their TV is through games consoles and other devices such as, um, uh, such as Apple TVs, such as plugging a PC uh, into, their, uh, into their TV so they can display all that content on it. Um, and so you look, smart TVs are actually all the way down there Games consoles, there are more games consoles per household than there are smartphones. And you think probably every single one of us has a smartphone in their pocket. That's a, that's a huge number of games consoles. And each of these games consoles probably has a, 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 is very likely to have a web browser on their TV, something more for you to look on, uh, something for you to create your websites for. And so thinking about the general web stack, what can we actually do to, to design our websites for TVs? Now, 
the, there's the usual three, th uh, usual three things you have to consider when, uh, and this is a simplified, when talking about any designing. So you have to think what the input is, how you're interacting with the screen, the output, the screen itself, the device, and then you. Where are you? What are you doing? Where are you in relation to the screen? Now, it's very, it's a simplistic question, but basically, solve that middle bit for all devices. Can we actually find, uh, can we find that really good middle ground that works for all devices? Now, for mobile and for desktop, these are actually very similar. But for TV, for actually kind of as you are now, you're kind of watching a big TV. If I was designing this for the web, I probably wouldn't do this. I probably would have a lot more information on it. I would probably have a very different design to what I, I have now. I mean, I've got a TV remote, effectively. I've got a remote control. I'm inputting very differently. The resolution's very different. The viewport's different. I'm different because I'm not even facing the screen. I'm facing you, you guys. You are you know, 20 foot away. There's lots and lots of differences in actually watching on the TV. And I want to go through some of those and kind of explain what we can do in order to make all those better and to actually make browsing on the TV kind of possible and designing for TV actually useful. So <coughs> basically, with a TV, you're about six foot away. Me here in my living room, I'm more actually about a foot away. Uh, and at Microsoft, because at, at Microsoft have actually come up with uh, a paper a few years ago called the 10-foot experience, uh, which is a, a term they coined about uh, that they then put into the Windows Media Center when they were designing that. And it follows a number of kind of quite basic principles. It's a very practical guide. But the, the basic principle of it is simplistic input and things are smaller when they're further away. So uh, if you've ever done, uh, done a... Th <laughs> It's, it's amazing. There's a Father Ted joke <laughs> was, uh, with the cow, the one that's smaller. Is it smaller or is it further away? No. Um, so basically, I mean, if you're in 3D graph, if you do any 3D graphics, if you want to make something move away from you, 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 move it, you actually just make it smaller because the screen doesn't move. You just make whatever it is smaller. So you think about uh, smartphones. Now, if you're looking at text on a smartphone, it's about six inches from maybe, maybe 10. Um, and say it's about 12 pixels of text. Let's do a quick, quick basic math, maths on this. So if it's 12 pixels of text, there's a viewport height of about 480 pixels on three and a half inches of uh, screen real estate. It's about um, 40 lines of text, potentially, on your smartphone. Move yourself to 10 foot away, and in order to uh, actually have, uh, in order to maintain the same perspective of my text is the same size, you have to, uh, you can only get 21 lines of text on a 42 inch screen, which is 21 and a half inches high. Basically, you need to double the text size if you're looking to, uh, if you're looking to make something readable on a television. And that's really good for well-sighted users. Uh, if you, you know, wear glasses, if you don't have as, uh, as good a vision, uh, then you'll probably want to zoom in as well and actually increase that text size even further. Um, TV manufacturers have realized this, uh, that text size really is a big issue. Um, and they've changed actually how their browsers behave to correct this automatically, or at least try to do it. And then when we do this on the mobile web, uh, <coughs> we do this using the viewport and device pixel ratio and so on and so forth. Uh, and I did a little... Uh, I did a little survey for, uh, for this talk, uh, and then uh, I asked a number of different questions. And one of them was, what's the resolution of your TV? Every single respondent said it's 1080p, 1920 by 1080. These are the viewports that are available on TVs. When was the last time you designed for 800 by 500, other than a mobile phone? What on earth is the PS3 doing at 1094 by 928? An 11 to 10 aspect ratio. That's absolutely crazy. So 
So basically, a 1080p resolution. You say, yeah, I've got 1080p. No, 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 I don't. I've got 800 by 500. Or actually, as a, as a general rule of thumb, you've probably got something more like 1024 uh, by 586, um, which is kind of Xbox 360. And that's kind of TVs and consoles. So if you add, the, if you add an iPhone into that, that's right at the top. That's uh, 480, 320-ish. Uh, iPad, 1024, 768 fits somewhere in the middle. So the majority of these TV browsers are more like iPads than they are desktops or mobiles. But potentially, actually, what you really want is a mobile context uh, or a desktop context rather than your tablet context. It's, it's really crazy because they've done this to improve your text size, but what they've actually done is screw with your web designs. Uh, and Luke Robluski has looked at this and effectively says the web browser viewport does not provide a good guide on how things should lay out. And in fact, if you rely on it, it will lead to probably quite poor designs. We cannot make assumptions of working with TVs based on screen size alone. We can't tell if the user is on their sofa or simply on their laptop resizing the screen. And that's where I got to pretty much with, uh, <coughs> with that. There's, um, there's not much more to say about screen size because that's where we get to. This is our, the limits of our uh, web design capability right now. Uh, and so we'll look at solutions for that in a minute. But we'll, we'll, go, on to, um, <laughs> we'll go on to input. This, this is a bit of a sorry state. We can't really do much with this at the moment. Um, so let's talk about the input devices. Now, a tip, traditional TVs, I've got a remote control. OK, that's what I'm thinking about. I've got a remote control in my hand here. But this is a problem normally. I mean, uh, these three remote controls, one's for the DVD player, one's for the TV, and one's for the Digibox. And that's really, <laughs> and for most people, that's hard enough as it is. If you want to add a smart TV and start actually browsing the internet, these are all the kind of devices that you could expect <coughs> there to be. Uh, TV companies have tried everything, full keyboards, mini keyboards, mini touchscreens, and all the way down to Harry Potter-style magic wands. <coughs> They've tried everything, but yet still the most common bit of input here is the D-pad on the remote control. So what browser manufacturers and TV manufacturers have started to do is create second screen apps. Your smart TV is plugged into your Ethernet, or into your wireless, probably. So you can then control it via another app on, uh, over, the wire, uh, over your LAN. Um, and actually, it gives you a pretty decent experience uh, for input. You've got a half-decent keyboard for once. You can type web addresses quite quickly. Um, and whilst using, uh, doing my testing, I tested with the Xbox Smart Glass. And actually, it was quite a good experience, despite still having a controller in one hand and a phone in another to do scrolling and type in on a keyboard at the same time, it was still far better than any other actual input that I've ever tested with a TV. But, so it's still the best there is right now. Um, <coughs> Microsoft kind of missed the trick with the original Kinect implementation, because voice input will come along. What you can do now is you can say, Xbox. Uh, search for google.com, because it, it goes to Bing, first of all, and that's the only thing it recognizes. <laughs> um, <coughs> after that, you're kind of stuck. You can't do anything more. Um, I, I'm led to believe that the Xbox One is better. But when I went to go and test the, X, uh, test the Xbox out, they elected not to plug the Kinect in. So um, hopefully, it's better, and I've been promised that it will be. Um, for the PS4, who knows? All they've told us about the browser so far is that it's WebKit and nothing else. Uh, I'm not as hopeful with that, for, especially for voice input, because the PSI is a, an optional extra rather than Connect coming bundled with everything. But all that said, voice input is basically just another mechanism that we as web designers need to consider that, because the technology is here. Uh, the new Nexus 5, you can wake up your phone and search without actually interacting with it. You can just talk to it, and it will work. And this will come to all parts of our technology very soon, as well as all the other inputs that I've just described. But if you are designing for TVs, you can basically assume that there's a D-pad, and everything else is a bonus. 
But that said, actually, is it a bonus? Is it more of actually, it's kind of a problem? Because what, if you have to design an interface for the D-pad for your arrow keys, effectively, on your keyboard, you can do that with JavaScript. But then if you want to add in um, uh, touch-sensitive controls, um, mouse controls for cursors, uh, if you want to add in uh, voice controls, and, and anything else that you want to add in on top, you'll probably end up making, uh, making an, an experience which suits none of those different things, because you're trying to be one thing to everyone. And it doesn't really work. And that's input. It doesn't really work. Brilliant. This has talked to you on really well so far. I'm so glad that I chose it. Uh, <laughs> honestly, so glad. Um, so uh, anywho, uh, that's inputs. We'll, we'll go on to um, actually what the output devices are. How good are these TVs at doing the internet? Uh, I asked my Twitter followers once again, kind of, uh, do you browse the internet on your TV? And these are the responses I got. <sighs> at this point, I should have given up. I genuinely should have given up at this point. Um, yeah. So everyone, the thing is, though, uh, the, the other thing that came out of is that everyone really wanted to use it, but they just found it really annoying, really slow, really painful to actually use. And so one thing that actually comes out of this is that it's possibly because the processors aren't that fast. So I looked into the specs, the actually what's under the hood for your typical smart TV. And it's not very good. Um, <coughs> The first generation smart TVs were effectively an iPhone, and that's a first generation 2007 iPhone. Uh, the latest ones uh, have a Cortex A9, and they are approximately iPhone 3GS, <coughs> iPhone 4, and that's a 2013 smart TV. So I can completely understand why people would rather actually pull out their phone out their pocket and use something with the same resolution screen, apps that are uh, designed for it as double or triple the RAM and a far faster processor, and it's right there in your pocket, rather than use the TV. But can it all actually be that bad? Are they all like this? Uh, kind of. So uh, we used the, uh, I went on to HTML5 test, and I ran as many tests as I could, and found they actually had quite a number of TVs and games consoles. And if you look at it by year, the Wii, uh, the original Wii, which has uh, Opera's Presto engine running it, um, and then the PS3's terrible implementation of NetFront. Uh, it's really not that good. Uh, under 100 is kind of uh, less than 99. Um, really kind of uh, old stuff. It will have some CSS3 stuff in it, but not a lot. You're, if you're looking at the top end, yes, there's a Samsung TV and a Toshiba TV. They're actually quite good these days um, on the HTML5 test scores. Uh, however, they're kind of the 2013 models. If you're looking for the 2012 models, you're looking at this gap right here. And why is there a gap? Because it doesn't run the test. <coughs> this is the LG 2012 browser. It's NetFront 3.5. Uh, it doesn't even get anywhere near acid, uh, the ACID 3. This is kind of IE6 levels of web browser support. And I honestly thought we'd left all that behind. <coughs> but no, this is now the graveyard of web browsers, your TV. Uh, and Samsung this year at CES said, people keep their TVs around for seven years. The average lifespan is seven years. John Lewis now have done an advertising <laughs> campaign that guarantees your TV for five years. Seven whole years. So all of these browsers here, if you bought a 2012 TV, which doesn't even make it onto this chart, by 2019, you will still have that TV, no matter how far, uh, how far technology has moved on. So how do we cope? Well, I personally cope by bolting things onto my TV. Uh, my TV isn't a smart TV, but it's got lots of inputs. I treat it as a screen. We make everything kind of bearable by, by ad, uh, putting in our add-ons. Um, and when I, uh, whenever, whenever I have a couple of friends around and I want to show them some cat videos on YouTube, I will actually just pick up the keyboard and it's a bearable experience. It's okay. And that's output. Another cheery subject. <coughs> so let's, uh, let's recap. What are the kind of scenarios we go through? 
So on the desktop, you might be about one and a half foot from the screen. You've got good, accurate input. It's a high, uh, large, high-resolution screen. Mobile, you're not that far different. Uh, it's not that different to it. Uh, you've got a touch, probably, um, and a high-resolution screen, but with a small viewport. We can transition between these two very easily. But a TV, you're 10 foot from the screen. You have a D-pad. You may have all sorts of other input types as well. And you've got a high-resolution screen, the same as mobile, but with a poor browser and a small viewport. So whilst the output might be quite similar to the others, because the other two factors are so different, actually designing for TVs is a nightmare, an absolute pain in the ass. That's not the end of the talk, by the way. It could have been, <coughs> but it's not the end of the talk. I've still got 10 minutes. We're fine. Uh, so are there any solutions to this? Really, are there any solutions? There must be somewhere. Is it even possible to actually make an interface for all devices? So I, I had a look around the internet. What is there? And I did some testing here uh, with uh, the Xbox. So this is YouTube. Uh, this is what YouTube does for their uh, mobile on the left, the iPad and desktop. Mobile, it actually reverts you to a, a mobile-specific site. Desktop is still a, res a responsive website, but it's kind of you know, okay. And this is what it looks like on a TV. <coughs> Nothing like it whatsoever. Um, this is what they call lean-back mode. Uh, you use your arrow keys for it, uh, and it works very much similar to the PS3's crossbar. Um, <coughs> compare that to the higher resolution <coughs> UI on the desktop, and you kind of start to think responsive design might not be the best thing if you're talking about larger screens. Looking at uh, BBC iPlayer, then, um, hopefully, you can see so, uh, hopefully you can see that. Um, it's mobile again, uh, a specific mobile website for your iPads and your uh, iPhones. Uh, on the desktop, you get a normal website. But the BBC have also gone and done their own big screen mode, they call it, that you have to access yourself. You actually have to go to a different URL in order to get this mode on your TV. Um, <coughs> so, I mean, these are the, the big boys, and what they've done is they've put their engineering resources into making something else, because they can, because they have it, and because that's one of the primary use, probably one of the primary uses for their service. I play as a TV service, after all. So uh, let's have a look at how the rest of the web actually copes on your TV. Really good. <laughs> hey. Well done, Remy. Remy clearly looked at the, talk, uh, the talks that I was proposing, thought Steve might do this. Steve might, might put my site up on, the, uh, on there. And, uh, uh, and actually, it works really well. You, can, you guys can clearly see it from the back. I can clearly see it from my TV. Yes, you have to scroll, but actually, it, it's really good. Well done. Thumbs up. Full marks. Um, same, <laughs> uh, same again for a list apart. Um, uh, really, uh, actually quite big text. Um, really readable and actually comfortable to read from, uh, from the 10 foot away. But the real reason that actually these, are, um, uh, these work well is because, firstly, they are responsive. They do use the viewport meta tag. They use media queries at many different, uh, many different resolutions. Uh, and they do cater for, what the, uh, for, the, uh, for their audience. And their content sites, more than anything. It's displaying text. It's all about displaying text, which is one of the things that people really do get wrong uh, on, uh, on TVs. Looking at BBC News, however, I get the normal BBC News website. Now, the Xbox's viewport width is 581 pixels. Uh, sorry, uh, 1041 by five, uh, 581. Now, uh, that should probably trigger the uh, responsive website, except it doesn't, because there's some user agent sniffing going on, and it thinks that this is IE9, not Xbox IE9. This is IE9. So it gives me the normal website, which for this is actually inappropriate. I can just about read that text. I can, just, I can read the headlines. I can see the images. But actually, I would rather have the responsive website at this point. But because it user agent sniffed, it didn't give me that. But don't worry, it's far from the worst. 
and <clears throat> I'd like to get the first mention in today of linkscars.com. <laughs> and here's a video. This is how it works and how it looks. And this is actually real time. Um, it's just recording on my camera. <coughs> it, is, it has so many GIFs, so much animation. It scrolls and takes ages to load. And this, normally on your desktop, it's actually quite smooth. But it's jerky, janky, and absolutely horrible. Um, <coughs> and it looks terrible as well. But yet still, <laughs> still it's a commercially successful enterprise, and I have no idea how. <laughs> So, I mean, that does all sorts of things, uh, all sorts of things wrong. Uh, so, <laughs> let's, uh, let's forget it. So, you can make terrible websites, no matter what. Um, but what we really think here is the 10-foot experience is very different from the 10-inch experience that we have. And right now, we, doing responsive web design, treat the two of them the same. And, and we shouldn't. Once again, Luke Robloski said screen size doesn't give us a complete picture of what we need to know to design appropriate, an appropriate interface for the TV. We can't make assumptions of working with TVs based on screen size alone. We cannot tell if the user is on their sofa or if they are, once again, on their laptop resizing their screen. We can't tell. Um, in fact, actually, there should have been a way that we can tell. Uh, back in CSS, uh, CSS2, there's a media type called TV. Yeah? Th that should be the thing that everyone should, be, uh, everyone should be using. Except that CSS media types are mutually exclusive. You can either be screen, print, handheld, or TV. <coughs> you can't be, can't be two things at once. And so all of these devices here all respond to screen. So effectively, that TV is the same as that laptop, is the same as that, uh, is the same as that iPad, is the same as the iPhone. They're all the same according to the web browser, and we can't tell them apart. And that's really annoying. And that's kind of our own fault as well. We, um, we don't normally do CSS for all and then other things. We, we think uh, media, uh, media screen and, screen and, or maybe handheld and. We don't do TV. It's never really come up. And so all the TV brand manufacturers chose screen instead. So kind of back to user agent sniffing then. Yeah? There aren't any features that we can detect. There's actually nothing we can do to tell if it's a TV or not. We could user agent sniff, but there's probably 100 different TVs over the last five years. And they'll all have different user agents. Are we going to regex against everything? Will we get it right? It still runs, net, uh, they all run netfront, which is web let's detect for WebKit and make all, everything, everything that's WebKit a TV. No, it's not going to work. If we can't tell, perhaps we should ask. Let's just ask. OK, so um, and Aaron Gustafsson, he of uh, adaptive web design fame, um, has uh, had a think about this and trying to tackle this head on and came up with this little plugin a few weeks ago called Couch Mode. Basically, you just drop it on the page, and it comes up with the uh, uh, with that little couch mode thing up in the top. You click that. Can you, can you just about read that from the back? Just about? How's that? Is that much better? Excellent. Fantastic. It's much better. You now have a, a couch mode. And what it does is uh, it uh, chain, uh, modifies the base, uh, the base font size into view, uh, viewport width um, CSS. So it multiplies it to about 1.8. Uh, 1.8 of the base height via viewport width. So uh, have a look at the source code. It's all there on GitHub. Um, <coughs> it's quite uh, very new. But actually, if you are just wanting to say, OK, have a couch mode, <coughs> it's quite a simple thing to do. Um, but all of this still relies on us and our media queries, and us basing our media queries on text. Because most of the time at the moment, we base our media queries on pixels. And pixels don't scale well. Or at least they certainly don't scale well with text. So effectively, we should be defining our media queries in M's. That's another, uh, another width, generally based off your 16-pixel uh, baseline font. Um, uh, Cloud4 has a really good example of this. So uh, this is the uh, pixel-based layout. But when you've increased the screen, 
increase the text resolution by zooming in, text size, and that will tend to break pixel-based, have an M's-based layout, and it will probably give you the right answer. Will react to changing the base screen, uh, the base font size as well. It's a really simple tip, and it also helps with then even larger screen, uh, even larger text, like a Kindle. Actually, uh, you can uh, you can then make for better uh, user interfaces based on the uh, on using M's and your font size. And is that kind of all we can do? Yes, probably. <coughs> but. It's not all pessimism, right? Uh, the outlook for TV is actually quite good. Uh, Xbox One and PS4 um, have got pretty decent uh, browsers, uh, HTML5 test scores. They are, there are really good modern browsers that you can have on your TV today. And the experience is going to improve. And I want to show you this little video which came out yesterday of you know, how people complain that all TVs were slow. I want to show you this. And you can see that it's left off right where I left it, right where I'd pause the screen. So I'll just start, and I'm playing with no waiting. I didn't have to load. I didn't have to find my save game. I'm right back where I left off. Fast. But the great thing about Xbox One is I haven't left anything behind. I'm still there with all of my content, with the dashboard, with any of the other applications I want to go to. Xbox, go to Internet Explorer. And now I'm in Internet Explorer. Xbox, watch TV. I'm back in some TV I was watching. Xbox, go to Forza Motorsport 5. And I'm right back to where I was in my game, and I can keep playing. I can go in and out of stuff. I can find the content I care about and just move through it really, really quickly. That's fast. That is really, really, really fast. Um, <clears throat> and with, uh, so the Xbox One, I don't work for Microsoft. I promise you I don't, um, <laughs> uh, despite the bag. Um, so uh, the Xbox One, you can plug your uh, Virgin Media or Skybox or uh, other DVR into it and actually view your TV through it. It's now a, an entertainment console with a really good browser and with a really good experience. And with voice input, with a half-decent uh, half controller, <coughs> it's a really, it sounds like a really good <coughs> console. And some potentially replace entertainment centers. It's going to take a while to mature. It's going to take a while to enter our homes. But to improve the experience just like, uh, really so much over what is currently available on TVs um, is absolutely wonderful. And I, I'm really looking forward to getting it. However, that's kind of 400 quid. Let's just not go out for dinner one night, and you could buy two of these. <coughs> Perhaps all we actually need for TV is Chromecast. Um, the very simple Miracast implementation. You use, your t uh, you use your tablet, your phone, iOS or Android, and you can then share it straight to the, uh, straight to the TV. They're in absolutely incredible devices, but they don't actually solve the problem that I've been trying to describe that we have today with designing for TVs. And TVs uh, represent the tip of the iceberg. There is far more to come. TVs are actually the easy bit. It's a screen. We can plug pretty much everything or anything into it through all the plethora of inputs that it has. And there's going to be more to, uh, more to come. Wearable technology especially. I mean, glass. Uh, glass is the equivalent of a 32-inch TV about that far from your face. <laughs> And that has all sorts of different uh, ways of, in, uh, of input. Uh, wearable technology, flexible, te uh, flexible screens, foldable screens, second screens, the list goes on. And those are the things that we've thought about already. Who knows what's actually going to come up around the corner? We can no longer assume anything kind of based <coughs> on the size of our screen. Uh, and Ethan Marcotte put this, put this really quite well. So basically, the number of problems we can actually solve automatically for our users are dwindling. We can't know reliably how much bandwidth a user has available to them, whether they're outside, outside or stationary, or whether they're mirroring their, mirroring their displays for a wider screen, or, or, or. The list goes on. And he goes on to say that we can solve the problems, but we have to acknowledge the gaps that we have as well. And we have to invite our users in to solve these problems 
to provide them with the ultimate experience that we can have for that app. And so, back to the diagram. I think for TVs, <coughs> larger screens, and in the future, we will have to add in user context, and the user will have to give it for us. So we can solve, and that's OK. We can solve for where we don't know the, out, uh, the output. We can solve for uh, the user, uh, where the user can tell us where they are in their own context. And we can solve for, yes, I'm using a remote. Yes, I'm going to use voice. We can solve for all of these things. And we can then provide the best experience that's possible. And so what I want to end on is saying, basically, solve the problems that you can solve. Responsive web design solves a lot of our problems. It doesn't solve everything. But when you can't solve it, such as TV, ask for help. And one day, maybe we will, we will work out a way to make it seamless and to actually solve this kind of bigger problem in our industry kind of together. Uh, and we will do. We will solve it eventually. And, and that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>